There we go. We had a couple of little technical issues here we had to deal with, but um, first off, I'll introduce myself. My name is Chris Macaluso. I am the uh, Center for Marine Fisheries Director for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, and I'd, I'd like to thank you all for being here again this year. I know we, we took a little hiatus, as did everybody else in the world pretty much last year, uh, except for you guys who were selling fish and tackle and managing all the folks who were out there fishing, which included me a lot. Uh, and uh, I pretend like my boss doesn't know that, but he probably does. Uh, so, uh, but um, it was an interesting year, obviously, and I think we've got uh, a very interesting discussion, uh, especially since in the last year, uh, this topic has become much more prevalent. And uh, with the new administration, with the Biden administration, uh, and with some of the changes that we've seen in Congress, uh, the push towards conservation uh, has become a lot more prevalent. And, um, you know, the efforts to, to find ways to preserve more of our land and our water uh, has, has become a much broader conversation. Um, I'd like first to, uh, to introduce um, a video from uh, the Assistant Secretary, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Commerce, Don Graves, who's going to provide us a few remarks uh, regarding the contribution of fishing to the United States economy and how the Department of Commerce and NOAA work to support our recreational and sport fishing communities. Hello everyone, it's great to be here with you today. Thank you Chris for that kind introduction. Thank you to the International Confederation of Allies for Fish and Trades for hosting this wonderful event. And thank you to the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership for organizing today's media summit on such an important topic. I know this group recognizes what the countless benefits are of recreational sport fishing, both personal and professional. At Commerce, we recognize that marine recreational fishing can contribute more than $40 billion per year to the U.S. gross domestic product strengthening our nation's economic security. Today, I'm going to be talking about the administration's America the Beautiful Initiative, a nationwide effort to benefit those of you who recreate, fish, conduct business, and earn a livelihood in, around, and on America's vast land and waters. But before I do, I want to touch on the Department of Commerce's deep connections to recreational fishing and boating, particularly our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. As many of you know, tie tables and navigational charts produced by NOAA are used by recreational boaters and fishermen to determine when to fish and how to safely get to their destinations. NOAA weather buoys, weather radio, and coastal water forecasts provide critical information to boaters and fishermen on weather and sea conditions, something my friends and I used just this past weekend when out of the water. NOAA tropical storm warnings inform millions of boaters of the first time to move to safety. And of course, NOAA Fisheries works with state and federal partners to manage fisheries and their habitats, allowing millions of recreational fishermen to get out of the water and enjoy America's natural beauty. Ensuring sustainable recreational fishing opportunities for this generation and future generations is a priority for NOAA, the Department of Commerce, and the administration. Today, you'll hear more from panelists, including our very own Assistant Administrator of NOAA Fisheries, Janet Point, about the America the Beautiful Initiative. This 10-year, globally-led, and nationally-scaled initiative was launched in response to a directive from President Biden to conserve at least 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030. Beyond this goal, the initiative lays the foundation for even longer-term conservation and restoration of our areas that are important to communities, to wildlife, and to our country. It focuses on combating three key threats, loss of natural resources and natural areas climate change, and disparities in access to the outdoors. Some of you may have already spoken to NOAA officials on the details of this initiative, and for those who haven't, you'll learn more from the panelists in a moment. One point I'd like to emphasize for you, though, is this initiative will not succeed unless it includes a full range of stakeholders, including fishermen like you. To that end, America the Beautiful is guided by eight key principles that are critical to our success. They include being collaborative and inclusive, conserving for the benefit of all people, supporting locally led efforts, honoring tribal sovereignty, 
pursuing approaches that create jobs, honoring private property rights and voluntary stewardship efforts, using science as a guide, and building on existing tools and strategies. We're still in very early stages of this initiative, but government can't do this alone. We need partners like all of you to see this initiative and to tap into the full potential of this industry. At Commerce, we're excited to continue working with recreational fishermen and others in the coming months and years to improve conservation of America's lands and waters. Thank you, and enjoy today's panel discussion. So before we get started with the panel, I think it's worth noting that um, Janet Coy joins us uh, just a few weeks after being appointed as the head of the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, just a brief introduction of her. Uh, she's also serving currently as the Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. Uh, she comes to NOAA uh, after working on natural resource management for more than 30 years, including spending the last 10 years as the Director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Uh, she's also been the Rhode Island Director of the Nature Conservancy, one of our great partners at TRCP. Uh, and she's worked as counsel for Senate EPW, uh, that's the Environmental Public Works Committee, uh, as well as working for Senators John and Lincoln Chafee. And I want to give Janet an opportunity before we start on our discussion of 30 by 30 to just say a few words about what she sees her role in, uh, in, in working with the recreational fishing community and how this administration intends to you know, build on what we've seen over the last decade, and that's improving our relationship from a recreational fishing perspective, our interaction with the Department of Commerce and with NOAA Fisheries. So with that, I'll hand it over to Janet for a few comments, and then we'll get started with our panel discussion. Uh, yeah, I think we'll just pass that microphone back and forth. Uh, if you'd like, I, I can wipe it down in between speakers. Okay, how's this? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Whit. Um, I want to thank uh, and, and Mike and the ASA folks, and Jeff and Pat, and, uh, Mike Kelly, all the people who uh, took me down and indoctrinated me last night. Um, I also want to recognize Tim Starbuck, who's here. Um, the, and he's uh, right now the acting chief of staff of the Northeast Science Center, so playing kind of an interesting, different role, but is one of your key people on recreational fishing. And then I just met Sean Meehan, who's here on a day off. Uh, to come and rep uh, NOAA Fisheries here, so thanks, Sean. First, what an impressive event, and as Chris said, this is my first, I've been at, in, at the post for one month, so you kind of vote with your feet, here I am. Um, I wanted to come and see what you're doing and uh, show uh, how much we respect and uh, value this partnership. And I'd say one of my goals would be to strengthen this partnership around providing access and opportunity for recreational fishing, focusing on sustainability and science-based management. Um, there's a ton of creativity and innovation in this on the floor there, um, and certainly I've been struck by the passion and commitment for conservation. Uh, none of this matters if we don't have healthy ecosystems. Um, so the work that we do together on uh, restoring ecosystems, conserving ecosystems, and that will lead into the 3030 discussion. I think is fundamental to the enjoyment of nature and all the benefits, including, of course, the huge economic benefits, the tens of billions of dollars uh, that drive our economy through recreational fishing. I want to say a little bit more about myself because I knew, although there's lots of friends that I'm seeing here, uh, Sarah Polly's nodding, uh, some great people I've worked with over the decades. Uh, so that's heartening because I feel like I've made a bunch of new friends already, um, but I've also reconnected with a lot of people here at ICAST. Um, but I, I'll just say a little bit more about myself. So the last 10 years, I've been the head of the Department of Environmental Management in Rhode Island. And part of my focus there was, and working for six and a half of those 10 years, I worked for three governors uh, with Secretary Gina Raimondo. So one of the things I bring to this role is a very strong working relationship with Secretary Raimondo. And I can assure you that she cares about outdoor recreation, recreational fishing, and fisheries. Uh, so that's going to be, when, when she talked to me about the role, she said, you know, kind of was questioning where I was on the org chart, and she said, look, you know, you have my number in your cell phone, don't worry about where you are on the org chart. And um, I think that's really valuable, um, and certainly your voices are loud and clear uh, on Capitol Hill and around conservation policy. 
that I want to bring that fisheries focus to commerce, which is such an important economic sector, um, and sometimes uh, maybe not seen that way. I certainly see it that way. In Rhode Island, a lot of what I focused on, I oversaw fisheries, and parks, and environmental police, and a whole host of other issues, environmental protection. Uh, but some of the things I'm the most proud of in my last job were really increasing access. So we put a beautiful new fishing pier in our new estate park, at Rocky Point in Warwick. We put, uh, we worked with NOAA on a reef ball project uh, off the shores of East Providence. This is part of the Narragansett Bay that wasn't even open for swimming um, because of water quality improvements over the last few decades. We've not only seen the anatomist fish and the recreational use of the bay increase, um, but we've seen, we've been able to reopen beaches and get people back on our urban rivers and in the bay. So obviously the water quality issues, whether it's cyanobacteria um, or algae blooms that we deal with are so integrally related to the work that you do. So that focus on, um, I'd love to always kick off the saltwater anglers, uh, Rhode Island saltwater anglers that is, uh, fishing camp, you know, trying to get kids excited about fishing. Uh, we put new boat ramps in many, many of our parks. Uh, there is a need to have access for all communities, but there's also real infrastructure need, and uh, the sport fish restoration funding was critical. Uh, Jessica was talking to Martha and some of your staff about that. It was critical for the states in terms of putting money into access and education and research around fisheries. So I clearly bring a state perspective, as does former Governor Raimondo, to the work that we're doing at NOAA, and feel that it's an incredible privilege to be able to be the head of NOAA Fisheries. Uh, some of the work, was, I just made the rounds, so sequelizer, you know, talking to people about some of our mutual goals of uh, reducing discards, um, mutual goals about getting other diverse demographics involved in fishing, um, reaching out to kids. I had the same experience in Rhode Island that I heard more about this morning that just our, all of our public, thank goodness for public lands, thank goodness for access to waterways, they were overwhelmed during COVID. Um, and we saw people who'd never been outdoors before, you know, um, sometimes it's sort of uh, amusing get-ups, but they were discovering or rediscovering nature. Um, you couldn't buy a used boat in Rhode Island. Everybody wanted to get out on the water. Everybody wanted to fish. Um, so that was a great uh, problem to have, um, but working together on making sure um, that we're doing things sustainably when we're working on um, um, ways to reduce waste, um, that we're promoting these opportunities to, to new generations and new people. That is kind of a hallmark of the Biden administration and the work that I want to focus on in NOAA. There's tons, people keep asking me about my agenda. Uh, you know, it is my first month, but, um, but the climate change work, and that is central to the 30 by 30 initiative too. We've seen in Rhode Island, and I've heard stories, you know, we've all been on the Pacific Coast in Alaska, significant stock shifts over the last few decades that have affected recreational fishing and have affected commercial fishing. My own staff just sent me a video of men even frothing the water. Um, and we've had, um, but we, we've also had, I think, tremendous successes, and we were really proud of the work we did on ecosystem-based management of men um, and our interest around forage fish and looking at the full ecosystem. And obviously that involves looking at warming waters and, and climate science. So that's another area. I've learned so much in the last four weeks, but the scientific work that we're doing um, at NOAA and that the states are doing um, and that we need to have inform our management, uh, that's a really exciting opportunity and if not now, when? And this is our opportunity uh, right now. So all right, that's, a, that's a lot about me. Um, I can shift into 30 by 30 or we can do that in the more panel format. But I just want to say again, thank you. Um, this has been an outstanding and impressive event. And it's been really uh, heartening and inspiring to be part of it so early in my tenure. And I'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for those great remarks. And, uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to meet you before this and, uh, and, and enjoyed that experience as well a few years ago, speaking to a bunch of recreational fishermen in Rhode Island who didn't necessarily see the world the same as I did, but uh, but, but, but sure were passionate about it, and uh, I think that's something that we all we all definitely have in common. It's something that very, you know, that you said that really uh, warms my heart and I think makes everybody in here happy is the 
the level of work that you did from a state agency perspective with NOAA, uh, you know, in using sport fish restoration dollars to provide more access to uh, the public and giving them more opportunity to fish. And I think that's a good way to segue into our discussion today about 30 by 30 because all of us in this room are committed to land and water conservation uh, and, and doing everything we can to, to conserve resources and manage them in a sustainable way. But I think without having the access for the public uh, to get to those resources, uh, um, you know, sometimes those efforts can fall a little bit short. So um, let's move on to uh, introducing the rest of our panel. Um, starting with, uh, you met Janet. Uh, Mark Gorelnik is the chairman of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. He's also the American Sport Fishing Association General Counsel. Jessica McCauley. Uh, is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission Director of the Division of Marine Fisheries. And uh, Chris Horton, who is the, the Director of Fisheries for the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation and also uh, the Director of Mid Senior Director of Midwestern States. <laughs> Don't worry about this. <laughs> Man, you got a lot of titles. So just to briefly introduce the 30 by 30 uh, issue. Uh, the Biden administration and many in Congress, some states, are undertaking an effort to protect 30% of America's land and water by 2030. It's referred to as 30 by 30. Uh, some of you may have heard that, uh, that reference here several times already. Uh, executive order uh, issued in January called for identifying steps to conserve at least 30% of our land and water by 2030. Some estimates are as much as 23% of America's oceans and seas and 13% of lands are already protected. Past efforts to create marine monuments and protected areas at times excluded input from anglers. And in some cases, recreational activities were eliminated from large sections of our oceans and coastal waters. And to make sure that this doesn't happen again, the hunting and angling conservation community have worked with the administration and Congress uh, to give very specific recommendations about how we move forward in this conservation effort. Uh, the administration's statement um, called Restoring America the Beautiful specifically recognizes in the first several paragraphs the cultural and economic contributions of hunting and angling and, and, and outdoor recreational activities. So with that, uh, we do have some slides, and I think we'll start with Mark. Um, Mark, if you'd like to go first, or if you would like to pass it off to Janet and let her kick us off with those remarks, I think we, we're open to either. Okay. Janet, why don't we start with you? All right. I will um, just give an overview, and then it looks like Mark has a really great PowerPoint presentation, so uh, I don't want to repeat anything that the Deputy Secretary said either. Uh, first, to uh, reiterate the point that Chris made, I think that recreational fishing community and the outdoor recreation community have been involved in 30 by 30 since it was just an idea um, and that you can see your fingerprints over in the America the Beautiful report. Uh, the goals are clear, um, but how we get there and what they mean is not clear. So the, uh, so, you know, the report talks about 30% of lands and waters by 2030 and talks about conservation and makes a distinction between protection or preservation and conservation and then talks um, quite a bit about really a continuum of approaches to conserving land and waters so that we preserve the functions and values of you know, the habitat, representative habitat, I think is really important, uh, but we're not uh, excluding uses that are compatible. And I know people were really worried about the marine sanctuaries and then you know, come to find out um, the vast majority of them allow recreational fishing. So I think our common goal here is to make sure that we conserve we hit this 30% goal before it's seeded, um, but that we define conservation in a way that allows appropriate compatible uses. Um, the report was issued in May. There will be an atlas that creates a baseline of protected areas that NOAA and other agencies will be working on. And then there's a lot of debate about what are the criteria that we should use to define conservation. And we'll want lots of input on that. Um, 
and you know what does it mean to be concerned and what are we counting. The other thing I would just emphasize is the report talks about using existing tools, and we have a lot of tools through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, we talked about the Great America's Outdoors Act and how it expanded that. Through the Magnuson Stevens Act, we've seen the council do really councils do really important conservation work. Uh, just recently, New England are around deep sea corals. Um, we have sanctuaries. You know, we have a number of tools available to us already. So it doesn't contemplate or necessarily require new tools, uh, but talks about how we can work really at a local level, state level, with stakeholders um, to promote conservation in lands and waters. A lot of it is still undefined. Um, so sometimes you can read it what you want into a report, and I know there's some nervousness uh, probably in this room even, but I can tell you um, that from talking to Brenda Mallory, the head of CEQ, and others that are intimately involved in this, I think there is absolutely um, an, an interest in working lands and the recreational use um, that will foster what we are trying to achieve um, here at ICAP. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mark, and then hopefully we'll have a discussion too. We sure will. Mark, uh, if you want to run through your slides, we'll go ahead and do that. So Mark, I think you've got a unique perspective on this because I think a lot of this 30 by 30 discussion really got started in earnest after early last year with some legislation that was introduced in California. And, uh, and you know, not only are you an avid angler in California, not only are you you're highly actively engaged in working with ASA, but you know, you're also on the Pacific uh, Fishery Management Council. So, I mean, I think your perspective here is very valuable in, in, in sort of relaying what you had to deal with from all of those different perspectives in, uh, in, in this legislation that was introduced last year. So, let's go ahead and get started. All right, uh, thank you, Chris. And as to whether my perspective is valuable, I guess <laughs> I'll leave that to the audience. Um, but thank you for that kind introduction. So, let's talk about first principles. And this is something we have heard uh, from other speakers here, what do we want as anglers? We want a healthy, robust, and abundant fisheries, right? As Mike Nussman would say, we're not very good at this, so we need a lot of fish out there so we can enjoy our pastime. And uh, we also want responsible access to those fisheries. Um, where access would be a problem uh, for management, uh, for biodiversity or whatever, then no one is gonna be clamoring uh, to beat down the door. But what do we not want? We don't want unnecessary and ineffective restrictions. Uh, sometimes, and I'm from California, so I can speak to some of those. Um, you, know, we're you know, we do embrace restrictions where it's appropriate because we want to protect, we want to conserve. That's, it's, it's in our blood. Um, we're conservationists first and foremost, and conserving biodiversity is in our wheelhouse. Um, and the United States, in each of the individual states, uh, do presently have some comprehensive statutory and regulatory schemes in place to protect biodiversity. So the question is, what's missing? Maybe something is missing, and through this process we'll find out what that is and we will address it. But I don't think we should presume that something that the sky is falling here, because I think that um, we should be on board with the notion of protecting biodiversity. Um, so where does this 30 by 30 come from? Well, it probably comes from a number of sources, but there is something called the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, and it set forward definitions in 1992. And I'm not gonna read them, but you can look in there at what a protected area is and what sustainable use is. And if you look at the protected area, which you know, it's basically a geographically defined area that's, de that's regulated. Is that not our entire EEZ? I mean, we, we do regulate fisheries. Now, I'm not talking here about other impacts, like from uh, uh, oil drilling or, or uh, wind turbines or anything else that may happen there. But insofar as the impacts of fisheries, this particular recreational fisheries, um, one could argue that, that the entire area is protected, but that may be not what we're, we're looking for in 30 by 30. Um, and in 2004, there was something called the Conference of Parties. They have these really funny names in international uh, dealings, uh, where they said, well, some protected areas should ban uh, extractive use. 
Why? I mean, if it's if it's to protect biodiversity, certainly. But if it's not necessary to protect biodiversity, then I think the burden is to is to establish why that is necessary. Now, in the, and I'll come next to the International Union on the Conservation of Nature. Um, put forward these standards. Thirty percent of land and waters protected. And again, what's that definition? And with 10% of strict uh, protection. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, I mentioned the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which has done a lot of work in this area, has a lot of definitions of the, of the categories of, of protected areas. It's composed primarily of NGOs, although NOAA, Interior, and BOEM are members. Um, they, in 2016, they put forward this goal, 30%. Marine protected areas. I'll focus here, obviously, on marine issues, not land issues. And there are multiple categories, um, much more specific than in the UN Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, they're not necessarily no take, but they are mostly no take. Uh, their categories. And the, the issue we're going to have here, and I come next to California, is that there are lots of perspectives on this 30 by 30, including among the environmental groups. Uh, in California, in particular, there were some groups who felt that we needed no-take areas. They put forward a bill last year called AB 3030, and um, we were dealing with some of the same organizations that had put forward the Marine Life Protection Act initiative, and I'm sure all of you, uh, or some of you anyway, will remember that, which was not didn't leave a good taste in the mouths of recreational anglers. Now, the bill purports to expand access and also to protect 30% of California's land and coastal waters. Now, the reason why the recreational fishing community couldn't get behind AB 3030 is because the authors would not include certain language. As I mentioned, we had a bad experience in California with the MLPA, and so we felt we, need, we, needed, uh, we needed some warm, fuzzy language in here. And what we asked, and this is actually language we specifically sought one, that it was not the intent of the measure to further restrict or limit existing opportunities or access to recreational activities. I don't think that's an issue at the national level. But in California, the, rec the, the proponents of this legislation would not agree to put that language in the bill, which I would have thought would have been fairly uncontroversial. We also wanted a recognition that well-managed and sustainable activities with low impacts are compatible with protected areas. And again, we were refused. So um, because we could not meet somewhere in the middle on that bill, in the state, we opposed that bill. And um, it, you know, 2020 was a tough year, and AB 3030 was a cloud that hung over the heads of the California recreational fishing community. But we did defeat it. It was not something we wanted to defeat. It, probably lots of us would have supported it if we could have gotten uh, some reasonable language in there, but I think there are some folks in the, in the environmental community there um, who, you know, they, they, they like closed areas, they like no take, and um, they, wanted, they wanted to promote that. So with the failure of AB 3030, uh, the Governor Newsom issued an order, an executive order. It's, it was before, but very similar to the executive order that President Biden issued. It states the same goal of protecting 30% of land and waters. It calls for the creation of something called a biodiversity protective to protect and restore the state's biodiversity. Obviously, we're all on the same page there. Uh, stakeholders uh, would be included, including recreational fishing organizations. In fact, I received a call from Chuck Bonham, who's the director in California, he called me at home to say I, we would have a seat at that table. Um, However, that uh, the strategies to meet the goal are due by February 1st of 2022, so it's a much shorter timeline than we have at the national level. Uh, they've held workshops, which are basically presentations like this from four speakers and then public comments, so there's really not much in the way of give and take. And I will say, to much to my disappointment, the recreational fishing community has not been included in any of these workshops and has not been approached to participate in the collective. So we have concerns in California. Again, if the goal here is to conserve and we're all in favor of conservation, 
that um, shouldn't be an issue, but because of our history in California, uh, and because the promised participation has not yet happened, um, we're concerned. So let's take a look at what we have protected in California waters. And I apologize for this California-centric presentation, but lots of things start in California. Some of them are good and some of them are not. So let, let's, uh, so already about 40% of California waters are protected beyond that which is provided under fishery management regulations. And 13.4% of California coastal waters are already no take. We have uh, national marine sanctuaries, we have state marine protected areas, there are federal seashores, and there are research reserves. So from that perspective, it, it seems like you know, we should be there in California. Um, again, our concern is that um, there, there is a hunger among some to, uh, to restrict further access. Uh, and of course, being a member of the Fish, uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council, I'm proud of the work we have done to eliminate uh, contact, uh, bottom contact gear and bottom trawl gear. We also established rockfish conservation areas, which really had denied access to recreational anglers to a great uh, stretch of area. In fact, those rockfish conservation areas are still in place today. But you know what they did? They rebuilt all of the uh, overfish stocks, except for one yellow eye, which is, which is rebuilding at, at a faster rate. So again, this is an example. Rec recreational anglers were limited in their access, but you know what? We have to rebuild these stocks. It's the responsible thing to do, and those sort of restrictions are those that we can, we can um, embrace as recreational anglers. Now, this is a view of what, uh, looking at the rocky substrate, which is where you'll find brownfish. I'm not talking about pelagics here. You can find those anywhere. Um, and you can see that access in central and northern California um, has expanded, actually, from 53% to 75%. Um, because stocks have rebuilt, but 25% are completely off limits. And I guess that would count as highly protected. In Southern California, uh, much the same, except in Southern California, there's an additional area called the cow cod conservation area, and which eats up about 25% of the rocky substrate. So already today in California, there's a great deal of protection, um, a great deal of highly protected uh, area. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail on the executive order because I think that uh, uh, Janet has covered it and I think Jessica is going to be covering it as well, but uh, you know, just as an overview, uh, we, again we have the conservation of 30% of lands and waters by 2030. The Secretary of the Interior is tasked with preparing a report, which is the report that we have, we'll be discussing, the America the Beautiful report. And um, again, Anglers are supposed to be a part of the process, and I'm sure we will be. Uh, and I, in, a, in a briefing we had, um, I think it was at a council coordinating committee call, um, we were told that, um, that NOAA is not going to be bound by the strict definitions of the International Union of Conservation of Nature. And that would be good because, as I said, most of those categories of protected orders don't uh, allow uh, take. So let me just say, you know, have we been conserving biodiversity all along? Well, councils, and I said on one of them, they're obviously they cover uh, all of uh, U.S. all U.S. waters. The jurisdiction is the entire ex exclusive economic zone. We're governed by the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Management and Conservation Act, and it requires that we protect habitats. It requires that we protect against overfishing while achieving optimum yield, and we recognize that from one of the national standard guidelines. We're supposed to minimize bycatch, minimize bycatch mortality. We're supposed to describe and identify essential fish habitat, minimize uh, adverse effects, and uh, all councils have or will have what's known as a fishery ecosystem plan. We have that in the Pacific Council. So I guess one would argue, is it the EEC already protected area with sustainable use under the UN Convention? It is. Now, whether that's enough is another question, but I think that uh, we should be proud of what we've done already. Now, in the, in the uh, Pacific Fishery uh, Management Council, we've uh, designated key habitat types, which will be a great tool as part of this process. Um, we have 39% of the EEC is, uh, there's prohibition on bottom contact. Uh, 
only 14% of the EZ is available to bottom trawling, and we've had a very successful record of revealing stops. Now there's one area where the Pacific Council has not been successful because we didn't have the power. Salmon are very important in the Pacific, because that would be in the Pacific Northwest and, and in Northern California. And we have designated essential fish habitat for salmonids. But you know what? They're in inland areas, so we don't have, uh, and NOAA doesn't have, really the ability to protect those habitats. So if we can get 30% of those inland areas uh, protected from adverse effects, that will be uh, terrific. All we can do so far is to write sternly worded letters. And, and let me just end with what does conservation mean? Um, my view is that con conservation is a goal, and protection is a means to achieving that goal. Think of protection as a verb. And so what protection means depends upon your goal. It's, protection is not an end in itself. So we do need a working, a principled working definition. Um, to, some, to some stakeholder, unfortunately, protection is a goal to be reached only through denial of access, and I don't think that that's appropriate. Um, and as we saw in California, they refused to acknowledge success of existing measures. We need, we need to guard against extreme views. Those on the one hand would say, let's pillage, which of course is not acceptable, or those who would say, don't touch. You know, there, there's a place we can meet where we can have responsible access while also protecting biodiversity. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well, it's a lot of information there, and you guys have, have certainly had a lot to deal with in terms of legislation being introduced and also if you work on the Pacific Council. I'd like to turn it over to Jessica, who's got some slides as well. And, uh, you know, she has a unique perspective being here in Florida where you've got, uh, you know, more demand, I think, for access to water uh, than pretty much any other coastal state. Uh, and so balancing that demand uh, and that economic activity with, with protection and conservation is, is a big challenge at FWC. So Jessica, take it away. All right, thank you, Chris. So Janet covered a number of things, so did Mark, just about what is 30 by 30. So I'm gonna breeze through some of my slides here. So uh, you heard Mark talk about a lot of questions. So prior to the release of that America the Beautiful report, uh, we felt like there were a lot of questions out there, like how do you define conservation? Uh, what is the role of the states? What is the role of the council? Um, Mark sits on the council, I sit on the South Atlantic Council. Uh, what are the existing measures that are going to qualify? How far back in time do you go uh, for these uh, qualifying measures? And will access be allowed? So you've heard us talk about access already up here, so I'm going to get into that as well. And do existing things like gear restrictions count uh, towards this protection? Uh, so you've heard a couple people talk about the America the Beautiful Report. Uh, so I had scanned through that. Um, I'm, probably, I'm going to primarily focus on uh, the marine fishery side, although in Florida we think on the freshwater and the terrestrial side that we think we're already there. We think we already have 35% of those uh, areas already covered. So it's a lot of questions on the marine fishery side. Uh, we talked about, or you heard people talk about the eight key principles. Um, I had glanced at some of these, uh, looking at how they might affect marine fisheries. I'm just going to kind of breeze through that and go over to how Florida might stack up here. Uh, so we, we heard about the atlas, which to me is going to set the baseline. And then I think there's going to be annual America the Beautiful reports. Um, there were some early recommendations in the America the Beautiful report uh, talking about uh, expanding collaborative conservation efforts with fish and habitats. Uh, that the report highlighted new marine sanctuaries. It also talked about the council process. You heard Gina talk about that as well. Uh, it also talked about increased access for outdoor recreation and investing in restoration and resilience of coastal and ocean resources. So, at the FWC, we've talked a lot about on this marine fishery side, how, how will Florida do, how will the FWC do? 
So uh, Florida could be kind of ground zero if you think about the various states and how climate change is impacting those states. Florida is almost like lots of little mini regions in one. If you think about the Florida Keys, we go all the way to the Florida Panhandle. We've got different habitats. Uh, you got different fisheries. And so uh, we have species that are already starting to move north. So if you think about yellowtail snapper, you think about snook, and uh, those fisheries were primarily concentrated in South Florida, and now they're definitely moving north. And so that's going to uh, pose challenges not only for state management, but also for the councils as well. Uh, the America the Beautiful report talked about marine sanctuaries. So we already have very large uh, marine sanctuary in Florida, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and we are working with them. Uh, we are a partner with them, and they are going through their restoration blueprint or draft environmental impact statement that was released, and it is talking about expanding that sanctuary and changing up the management of a number of different areas inside the sanctuary. Uh, also, in Florida, in state waters and in federal waters, there's lots of areas. Um, you heard Mark talk about kind of a patchwork or a network of things like gear restrictions. So in state waters, no gill nets are currently allowed. In federal waters, there's areas uh, where long lines are not allowed off of Florida. And I would say that in Florida, we're, we're already valuing fishing and boating. Uh, we're leading the nation in the number of anglers, angler expenditures, and boaters in the nation. So we're very interested in what are the next steps. Um, we look forward to discussions with the states and with the councils about establishing these baselines and what all is going to be in this atlas that comes out. Uh, very interested in what the metrics will be for assessing whether something qualifies, especially newly established areas. Uh, we also look forward to discussions with the fishing community about this, uh, such as the NOAA Recreational Fisheries Summit coming up next year, and also the timelines and the metrics that will be used. I'm going to stop there and pass it over to Chris. Yeah, and Chris, I'm, I'm, you know, we're interested in hearing your perspective, obviously, because you know, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, I think once this 30 by 30 conversation started getting ramped up, you guys uh, really spearheaded an effort among uh, the, the advocacy groups and the conservation groups, um, you know, on the recreational side, to define what it was uh, that our community wants out of this effort. Uh, and you call it Hunt Fish 30 by 30. Uh, you know, it's something that was brought up on a TRCP conference call for probably 16 months straight every time we had one. Uh, and so it's something I know all of our organizations are talking about. But can you, uh, you know, give us a little bit of the background on, on how that was developed and, and what the ultimate recommendations are and, and how you think that influenced the policy directives we've seen so far coming out of the administration? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, well, we were just barely hearing about 30 by 30, I guess, late 2019, early 2020. There was a Senate and the House resolution, and this Congress begins just a resolution. Kind of encouraged in the fact we embrace this 30 by 30 notion in the U.S., but it wasn't until a California bill came along we realized, man, this could really turn bad in a hurry. Uh, we've always been about conservation in the sports community on the hunting and fishing side. I mean, we supported the establishment of state game and fish agencies at the turn of the last century when we realized we did have a lot of work to do because we had over exploited our natural resources. We supported uh, on the hunting side the Pittman Robertson uh, tax, uh, which burdened the 10% or 11% excise tax on firearms and ammunition. To a separate account and that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services managed, uh, administers back to the state fish and wildlife agencies for habitat restoration and wildlife management. Well, that program worked so well, it was this industry and anglers that went to Congress and said, well, tax us in the late 40s, the 1950s, the Angle Johnson Act was passed. And we had a similar program on the fisheries and flight side. And that got a big bump in 1984 with the Wallet Row Amendment. Yes, it was, it was the angling and the boating industry and anglers that went to Congress and said, this program can make it so much better. So we were able to expand the list of taxable items and actually capture part of the federal marine fuel tax uh, it's attributed to motorboat fuels and small engines, which gave it a big, big shot. I say all that because we have actively advocated for uh, on the ground funding, taxing ourselves, voluntarily taxing ourselves to make sure that we have the, the resources the state agencies need to be able to manage our, our fisheries and aquatic resources. So, uh, since that time, since uh, I guess it would be 1939, the first receipts, that's a, 
that has generated more than $71 billion uh, for fish and wildlife management uh, on, on backs of hunters and anglers and, and uh, the industry. So it's a incredibly successful program. 30 by 30 sounds like something we would be able to all in for because we're about conservation, but but we're all in provided that they're that hunting and fishing is recognized uh, for, for as compatible use of the uh, of the resource, and that we we look to build upon the existing programs we've already had in place. I mean, the United States has been a, a leader in conservation for uh, the rest of the world. It should be highlighted as a leader. So we realize that I mean, we're going to get ahead of all this. You know, some folks. We're, we're nervous about endorsing this, this whole notion by, by coming up with uh, or getting out in front of it. But uh, at the end of the day, we realize that if we really want to be part of the conversation and trying to help drive this train in the right direction, which is better conservation, then we had to do something. So it, we started out small. We took a, a crack at a draft of a statement from the hunting and fishing community, uh, then started sharing that with, with a few groups, ASA, TRCP, and some on the hunting side, uh, and slowly grew our, our cooks in the kitchen, but it still took us five months to get the statement that we could all kind of agree on. Um, so we had the statement and we had to, we, we rolled it out in October uh, and, and waited, we disseminated that statement, that information, we developed a website, hunterfish3030.com. And uh, I believe that published the first or second week in October. And within minutes of that being published, uh, Senator Udall and Senator Bennett staff, two chancellors, two leads on the, on the Senate resolution, called our office and said, we want literally within 15 minutes of that press release to come out. So we're going to have a conversation. So we had a long conversation with our offices and it still seemed like this was really just an aspirational notion at this point. There has not been a lot of uh, sideboards put on it or, or where we're, how we're going to get there or, or whatever. So you know, that told us right then that we did the right thing. We kind of put our stake in the ground and, and, and made it known that we we're about conservation. We want to work with you about con on conservation. But here's what needs to be in any policies that that uh, are any thirty by thirty related policies. Got kind of pulled up here. But, uh, I want to make sure I don't miss them. Uh, again, it can't be merely uh, uh, aspirational. They need to be objective based and clearly define what conservation is. We need to recognize uh, the existing management actions we already have on the landscape out there. Uh, we need to identify additional conservation measures and actions that are based on an objective, science-driven, and stakeholder-engaged process. We need to enjoy or, or employ the least restrictive measures possible. We need to leverage the conservation strategies that are already in place, such as the state wildlife action plans. There, every state has a state wildlife action plan. Uh, there are some 12,000 species of plants and animals uh, identified in this country. We're, that are the, the species and greatest conservation need. We're way above, ahead of other countries. In fact, we've already identified where we need to do the work. And to do that work, designating large areas of land or water in, 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 in preservation is not gonna actively be able to address the needs of those species. We have to actively help manage those species. So we've already got swaps. Uh, as one example. The National Fish Habitat Partnership is another example. In 2015, they released a report they did. The first time ever a study had been done uh, on all of our streams and lakes and rivers in this country is to where our priority needs were, where our healthy streams and lakes were, or where our priority needs were. So we already, we've already identified where we need to work. And then finally, the last one uh, was that we needed to recognize that hunting and angling are compatible pieces of the resource um, that can be used in harmony with other management objectives. So uh, we felt like we positioned ourselves very well with that. Uh, when the President's Executive Board came out in January, uh, we immediately, uh, the coalition, started reaching out to the agencies that were responsible for developing these list of recommendations. They were all receptive. They all had conversations with us early on. They had all seen our statement. They all thanked us for our statement. Because again, there were still a lot of questions in everybody's minds about what, what are we doing here? How are we going to get there? So we felt like we were in a, in a pretty good uh, position. And then, uh, as, as we talked about, the uh, we saw the America the Beautiful report came out. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised and, and cautiously optimistic that we are continuing to drive this train kind of in the, right, the right direction. And really, that's building upon, again, many of our successful programs that we already have in place out there. Uh, this is about better conservation. We're in. It's about just preservation, locking up large areas of land. We're out. That's not what it's about. And we've demonstrated in this country that we can, we can enjoy our resource, we can conserve it. Uh, hopefully we're just going to be able to drive more uh, 
resources on the ground. And, and although it's focused a lot on marine, because we do have some concern on the marine side of our MGAs, we kind of see 30 by 30 as a real opportunity on the on the freshwater side of things, especially with the National Fish Habitat Partnerships. I mean, we finally, after 13 years, several of those through working with Congress to get the National Fish Habitat Partnership finally congressionally authorized. It was last fall. So we have a mechanism there. It's only funded at $7.2 million for 20 partnerships across the country. I mean, this, this will be a real opportunity, I think, to, to be able to elevate those programs and drive resources to the ground so that we can uh, do the fish conservation work we need to uh, in, in partnership with private landowners. So, uh, so I think we're in a good spot now. The next round of recommendations that we're putting together as a coalition that's almost ready to uh, to be finalized in the next couple of weeks is we have put together kind of a list of what we think should be in that baseline and what how we define conservation. Uh, and we'll be submitting those to the administration uh, after some conversations with these three agencies. I do want to give a, a hats off to, to uh, NOAA Fisheries because they did have, they're the first agency I know of that have actually kind of set up some stakeholder meetings and reached out to us and we participated on a call three or four weeks ago and had a good conversation with Sam Rouse. So, uh, stay tuned, stay engaged. Uh, I think I think we're in a good spot to be able to I think talk about better conservation and not necessarily preservation. So. And, and Chris, I think uh, you know you getting those groups together and and, and, and putting together a statement of, of what we're forward, putting something very forward facing like Unfish Thirty by Thirty out there is uh, you know a trend that we've seen among conservation groups over the last let's say two years uh, in. You know, being very forward about what we want out, out of efforts on the federal and state level, especially the federal level. You know, what do we want our legislation to look like? What do we want policy directives coming out of the administration to look like? Uh, you know, instead of simply, uh, you know, telling people what we don't like uh, all the time, you know, we can be forward in, in saying these are the things that we like, and we can help get you there, but you have to include us in the conversation. Uh, and I think it's very important that those organizations have come together. Uh, to do that. I'd like to, to ask you all, you know, one final question and then open it up for questions because uh, we do have to get Ms. Coit to the airport, but, um, you know, I think a common theme, theme among this is, you know, we all agree that the greater protection of the resources is, you know, uh, paramount in, in, uh, in its importance to all of us in the room. But putting some definition on what that's going to mean is the key here. Uh, we'll start now at the end of the table with Jessica. How close do you think we are to getting some um, some definitions there, some real refinement in, in what the goals are and how much work do we have to do over the next couple of years to get, to get there? Yeah, great question. So I do think we're pretty close. And it does seem that the America the Beautiful Report, as Chris was talking about, on the freshwater side, on the land side, it's, it's pretty specific. It seems like it's already kind of defined in there. It's on the marine side when you think about uh, waters off of the states, you think about federal waters and the role of the councils and what is going to count towards that. Um, uh, I think we're, I think we might be already there, but it is about how you're going to define that, how you're going to count things. Uh, at least for Florida, I mentioned before that we think we're at 35 percent, you know, not looking at marine waters, looking at marine waters, depending on how you define that, uh, we might be exceeding the 30 percent already. You think about the size of the sanctuary, you think about our gear restrictions and, and other things, so I hope we're pretty close with the definition. I hope so too. I, I think, um, you know, when you take a step back and look at some of the programs that have already been enacted, certainly there are ways to improve and tweak those things, but you know, I think we've done a very good job uh, in, in trying to achieve as much protection and restoration. And I think that that's a critical thing here too. You know, when you're talking about some large-scale habitat restoration efforts, like the things that are being undertaken in my state, Louisiana, and what's happening in the Everglades, you know, how do we count those things towards this conservation effort as well? Chris, I mean, your thoughts on how close we are? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, again, that's that, that's a great question, and I guess it's all a matter of a, uh, perspective. You know, I, I, I really I don't like focusing on this thirty percent number. Uh, I would rather us focus on strategic strategically where are our conservation needs. Again, the state wildlife action plans uh, identify those. That would be an expensive measure to address all those needs there, but. Uh, just yesterday, finally, we got a Senate version of the, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act introduced uh, for the first time. So we 
got momentum headed that way, and that's that's a lot of money that we get put on the ground for state wildlife action funds. And that's if, if this whole movement, which was begun around the notion of biodiversity conservation and not necessarily this arbitrary number of 30%, whatever, if biodiversity conservation is what we're actually about, then it's through state wildlife action funds that we can get there in the United States. Um, the flip side of that is to do that, we're going to have to be working with private landowners and in working lands. I mean, whether it be southeast forest, you know, like the Longleaf Pine Restoration effort that's going on in the southeast, tremendously important work to be able to conserve a number of species that were naturally adapted to those type of habitats that we've lost over the course of years. But to be able to do that, we have to, to keep those lands valuable to the landowner. They have to be able to harvest that timber from time to time. You know, to keep that land in the family not so far off the development. So these enduring measures that you keep hearing about this 30 by 30, it's, it's just, it's not gonna work on the 30, on the, on the private land side. We'll never get to some 30% magic number on the private land side. But if we're truly talking about species conservation and we're addressing those needs in partnership with private land owners, then I think if we're not there, we can, we'll, we'll pretty close to that. Uh, and I know you addressed a lot of this um, Janet, but if uh, any additional comments you may have about how close you think we are, and, and really from your perspective, you know how, how important is the, the engagement on the state level and the private landowner level? So I think it's um, critically important, and if you look at the report, and I do encourage people to read it and to comment, and we are taking feedback. It does hit all the notes um, that Chris and others talked about. It talks about being locally led, and I think of it almost as you know. Russian nesting dolls or something. You have the work going on at the local level. You have the state wildlife action plans that work going on at the state level. You have the work going on in places like Noah Fisheries or the Nature Conservancy or TRCP looking at a national scope. And we've got to look at it as a mosaic that all fits together. Um, I, I want to make two points. One, I agree that the marine area I think is a little tougher. Um, and one of the things we've seen in Rhode Island and we've seen in your respective states is even protected areas like um, um, there's a beautiful marsh, Cogashoal Marsh, um, Prudhon, uh, Prudence Island is part of the Narragansett Bay National Estuary Research Reserve funded by uh, NOAA. Um, but it's protected, um, but it can't, the marsh can't keep up with sea level rise. So it is now um, slowly being destroyed, and it's got beautiful uh, New England stone walls right behind it. It can't migrate. So I think that the restoration. I, you know, I don't really know the answer except on the criteria. I think it's going to be a hot issue, but I think we've got a lot of data and information. But I think it's critical that we look at restoration because even so-called protected areas are often um, being degraded and no longer achieving the functions and values. I was kind of being the, around mangroves with the keys a couple years ago. When you see these areas, you guys see it with corals. So I think we need to be actively managing and restoring it, and that's got to be part of this equation. Um, but I do encourage people just some of the fears that folks have. I mean, the report is not just about biodiversity. It is about access. Uh, it is about um, uh, resilience, which I think you know means having corridors. Uh, when I worked at TNC, we talked about save the stage. We're seeing the species composition change um, pretty dramatically in some places, but we need to make sure we have the habitat structure of the marine environment. You know, so that whatever happens, we still have habitat for species to thrive and have a chance. Um, so anyway, going way beyond your question, I, I think there'll be, you know, with the environmental community, the fishing community, everyone can always argue about everything. So it won't be easy to develop the criteria, but I think we have all this, the building blocks for that. Um, I think that we that should, that we are pretty close. I think that a lot of different groups and scientists have worked on that. And I think the representative aspects, you know, you want to have all uh, tundra, no forest, or whatever, you know. You, uh, so I think that representativeness is really important, too, in this equation. I would also say 30% is not a ceiling. Um, so, you know, I think it is kind of an arbitrary number that people could galvanize around, um, but it shouldn't be kind of what we're aiming at specifically. Thank you. Mark, we'll give you the last word, and we, we should have time for a couple questions. All right. Thanks very much, Chris. You know, I think we are in a, headed in the right direction at the federal level in marine areas. I, I think that terrestrial will be much more challenging, um, but you know, we shouldn't kid ourselves. Globally, biodiversity is a, it is, it's a crisis situation. Um, uh, illegal, unreported, uh, uh, unregulated fisheries on the high seas, um, 
We have other nations don't have the same uh, statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't see if we can do better here in the United States. But the global biodiversity problem, I don't feel personally, is centered in the United States. Um, but we need to keep our house in order. We need to do the right thing. And if we're not protecting things adequately, uh, we need to address them. Uh, I think that looking ahead, we, you know, there's this figure of 30%. Uh, but then you see that some folks are going to, how much of that 30%? Well, not only does what is highly protected mean, but you know, to some, uh, as I think the IUCN or the UN Convention on Biological Diversity talked about, ten percent is highly protected. Well, most people interpret highly protected as no take. So, are we going to a ten percent no take? And again, coming back to my very first slide, where are our shortcomings? If we're already protecting biodiversity, or if the threats are from outside the recreational fishing community. Why do we want to visit more restrictions? Again, not ruling it out, but let's put the burden on those who want to impose closures to establish that they're necessary. Okay? Because I think that in a lot of areas, we want, to, we want to adopt the least restrictive alternative that will meet the goal that, that the president has set in the executive order. Good. Um, I want to say one thing about private lands, because I left that out. When I was just in Seattle, um, we were talking, we had a conference call um, with Weyerhaeuser talking to private uh, forest landowners about a um, habitat conservation plan under Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act for salmon. And it could have led me to wonder how that would that be the land or a water, you know, it's probably the land, but they're looking at you know, maintaining cold water streams. And that was a, a discussion underway of around 9 million acres of private land. Clearly, private lands have to be part of this equation. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Please, we have time for a few, and um, I would encourage you guys to, to ask away. Martin. This question for Jessica. Jessica, um, you mentioned that on the terrestrial side, that the uh, water will get to 30%. Can you tell us how you make the calculations that the state and federal have to do this? It's a combination, so we actually have some maps, so it's something that I can certainly provide. Uh, we don't have it on our website yet, but we've done our own analysis, looked at things like National Wildlife Refuges, uh, looked at other areas that have some type of protection, and when we look at that, we're at 35%. Chet, you had your hand up? Yeah, you mentioned a bill that just passed that allocated uh, federal dollars. Can that be used to incentivize uh, protections? Well, uh, I was talking about two, two bills. The bill, the bill that passed was part of the, the American Conservation Enhancement Act last year had a provision in the National Fish Habitat Partnerships, and that is there are 20 national, uh, there are 20 partnerships spread across the country, basically cover the entire country in some manner. Uh, they, that was authorized at 7.2 million, which was actually what has been in the President's budget. Um, program has been going on a long for a long time, 13 years, but Congress has been uh, willing to kind of authorize it. So that's that's kind of what, what I was getting at is, is I hope that that would be an opportunity to uh, to authorize that at a higher level and or through some other programs. There's been some talk in some of the infrastructure packages now, some stuff on fish barrier removals and I know at least six if not seven of the, the partnerships actually focus on fish barrier removals for, for salmon and and fish passage, so there is a way to influx other money, but that's that's what we're hoping is that there's there's a way that we can drive more resources on the ground for fisheries conservation um, in, in freshwater as well as coastal coastal environment. The other bill I mentioned was the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is one point uh, was one point three billion dollars, uh, and then another nine hundred or ninety seven million dollars for uh, for tribes, but that. That is was really that whole bill was crafted around the need to be able to address some of these other conservation needs we have in this country, other than just relying on hunters and anglers, the Pippin Roberts and Daniel Johnson funds to, to, to support that. So that was a part of a blue, uh, blue ribbon panel several years ago with Johnny Morris uh, co-chair, and uh, and they came up with, with a recommendation, and, and this is the third, fourth iteration of that bill. So things just moved really slowly in Congress, but. Finally, had one in both chambers, and there seems to be a lot of support for it, and it kind of fits right in with this 30 by 30 uh, initiative. Because you know, here's our species and greatest conservation need. How are we going to fund that? So we got a bill sitting out there. We got to get it passed. 
Fred? What about spawning aggregation sites? Is that part of the whole base of the study being affected during spawning the mosaic, or is that? I'll take that one. <laughs> so uh, FWC recently protected Western Dry Rocks. Uh, so that's a spawning aggregation site uh, south of Key West. And we work with anglers to do that. It's not year round, it's just a seasonal protection. But I didn't get into the eight principles, but we felt like that was an example of you know anglers working with our agency. So it's kind of a grassroots effort in the beginning. It also came through the sanctuary, but ultimately FWC took it up because we had the authority there in state water. So we felt like that kind of checked the box on a number of different principles that were in the America the Beautiful Report. So at least from our perspective, we felt like spawning protections would count uh, towards the uh, 30%. Sort of a related question to that. Uh, you know, one of the tools that the council uses is creating a habitat area of a particular concern, HAPC, and they don't have to necessarily have associated fishing regulations, but that does initiate a NOAA consultation if anybody is going to do any sort of, uh, but those consultations don't necessarily have teeth, right? It's just like, is this going to screw something up, yes or no, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that whoever is going to be doing activities in that area has to adhere to that advice. So uh, I guess I wonder if anybody has a sense of whether or not designation of an HAPC would sort of count towards that 30%. Because, you know, I, I don't want to not make a right, I, I want the, the, the areas to have teeth and to have meaning, but, you know, it seems like if we get to designate our own criteria for which we're using, it could go either way, right? So just thoughts on HAPCs and how they fit into this. I, I, think I think the question is, or the answer to the question is, um, does it protect biodiversity? You know, in the, in the Pacific Council, we have vast areas that have been designated ha habitat areas of particular concern. We don't allow bottom contact. The, the, you know, a lot of the, you know, we have different uh, fishery management plans, but one of the, the biggest one is groundfish. We have all, we, have, we manage over 100 different species of groundfish. What do groundfish rely upon? They rely upon that benthic habitat, right? For spawning, reproduction, uh, growth, etc. And so most of that is off limits uh, to, to bottom contact, or at least it's off limits. Well, I think 86% is off limit to trawling. And then the other kinds of bottom contact might have to be like pot gear, that it's, it's uh, I think it's something like 40% is off limits to that. And then frankly, a lot of it is really too deep to be fished anyway. So the goal is to protect that habitat. But protecting that benthic habitat is one thing, protecting bottom conduct. Uh, you can go ahead and pursue pelagics higher up in the water column without having, having any negative impacts. And in fact, in California, uh, amongst the marine protected areas are called conservation areas. Conservation, conservation areas allow for trolling for salmon, but not the take or not the take of benthic species. So yes, hapsies can be a useful tool. I do think they should be recognized, but I think a lot depends upon what sort of regulations might go along with. But they, they can be enduring. By the way, one of the objections we got to council action in California uh, was that they supposedly weren't enduring because they could be changed. And to the response, of course, says, any law can be changed. Yeah. The Constitution can be changed, right? Yeah. So, you know, and let's not get hung up on the term enduring because that becomes a trap. I, I would just add that I think that the two management councils are a really important way for stakeholder engagement and conservation outcomes to be achieved in the marine area. I think we're well set up to accomplish that um, using science and, and working with people who are already hopefully very engaged in sustainability and committed as they are when they get sworn in to uphold the Constitution and the Magnuson Stevens Act. And I would hope everybody at this conference is excited about 30 by 30 because I think it does uphold the values that you hold dear and that connecting with people to these places um, in the future is something that uh, fits perfectly with the mission and the outcomes and the economic uh, aspects of what you're trying to promote here at this conference. And, and I would just add, I mean, the only risk here is some will use 30 by 30 to put forward an agenda of unnecessary closed areas, and that's what we need to guard against. 
at least in California, I don't think it'll get found. But we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and, and I'll close by saying that uh, you know, it's not always that we are, to use Chris's term, cautiously optimistic about, uh, about efforts that come from agencies and administrations uh, in dealing with more restrictions and regulations on hunting and fishing. But with this, with this effort, uh, I, I think cautious optimism and, and pleasant surprise is, is kind of where we are right now, and, and hopefully we continue uh, down that road. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for being here today. I'd also like to I would also like to, to, you know, something I think I've, I've not done in the past in doing this is thank our staff. Uh, Tara Schultz, uh, Jenny Henry, Corey Deal, Kristen Brady, uh, our communications and development staff who really played a key role in pulling all this together. We'll be here again tomorrow at the same time for the very lively conversation about how do we manage Gulf of Mexico Minnehaven, my favorite subject by far. I mean, ranks right up there with Red Snapper in terms of things that I love to talk about. And, uh, and we'll be back here for lunch uh, tomorrow, so please join us again. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>